Thanks, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, um, talk to you a little bit about the work we're doing. I'm, I'm going to try to give you sort of an end-to-end -end, uh, uh, view of sort of what our motivation is and then what we're actually doing in terms of implementation and, and some ideas about where we hope uh, we're heading um, uh, with our program. Right, so uh, motivation uh, for the NRT program overall and NRT implementation. A little bit about the work we've done to broaden participation uh, in STEM graduate education at the uh, University of Oklahoma and, and to think about the problem uh, more generally. Um, and then uh, some issues about how to uh, tackle this idea of convergence around uh, the science issues that we're interested in. And sort of that's kind of where we're headed. Um, whoa. Um, so I'm, uh, imagine I'm sort of talking uh, to the converted here, but um, we see a lot of um, evidence in the literature uh, repeatedly, continuously for decades about the value of interdisciplinary graduate education, uh, particularly for my interest relative to environmental sustainability and sustainability issues, right? It seems to be a topic that really lends itself to uh, interdisciplinary solutions. But we also see, um, uh, and, and we see that um, evidence that, that the people who would hire our graduates um, also want us training students in this way, right? Um, and the people that would fund our science want us training students in this way. And so this seems like the perfect opportunity, and right, everybody would obviously be doing this, and, um, and there would be great models out there to do it, and we know that that's not the case. And so we wonder really what are the limitations um, on those sorts of things, right? So we have all of these great um, uh, sort of uh, lessons learned that came out of the IGERT programs, and, and I can say that um, at this point I've learned a number of these lessons myself uh -huh, over and over again, um, and, and, and they do resonate with me, right? So these are good, um, good points uh, to take home. Um, but we also have institutional challenges, right? And so this is a, a special issue in, uh, in nature uh, from a few years back, and I just pulled this one quote out of here because it, um, it suggests that you need to sort of build a new uh, infrastructure in order to do it well, right? So that, that the sort of traditional academic structure is a problem for uh, interdisciplinary training. Um, and then out of the recent uh, convergence report, we see sort of, uh, the same thing, right? So um, uh, science education still fits awkwardly into academic structure um, that is layered and discipline-based, right? And so um, in many ways what we're trying to do is, is solve this problem, right? We know that um, we have this conflict. Um, and so uh, our effort to do that is this NSF research traineeship program. It's called Aeroecology as a test bed for interdisciplinary STEM training. I'll talk a little bit about what aeroecology is um, and, and sort of where we're headed uh, with that and, and how we're going to train students. Um, for, for right now, you, you can just think about all of the, so um, most animals fly, right? That's something we don't think about, but most animals fly. Um, the reason they fly is because the airspace is very important habitat. It lets them do things that you can't do otherwise. Um, and think about all of the things that we increasingly use the airspace for, right? And so um, we have the ecology of all these animals, which is evolved to use that space, and now we're realizing, hey, <laughs> that space um, is, can be really uh, valuable to us for a whole bunch of other reasons, too, and that uh, sets up its own conflict. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a few minutes. But first, I want to go into the, um, the training program a little bit. Uh, here's our team. Um, Meteorologists, uh, geographers, uh, anthropologists, uh, uh, communication scholars. Um, and I also want to point out, um, I, I mentioned uh, the sustainability of the curriculum. So the way that we're going at this um, issue is that we also have two other institutions that are partners. Um, so Jeff Bueller, uh, right here, uh, is at the University of Delaware, and Matthew Vandenbroek, is at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And so what we're doing is, and this, this was uh, our proposal, and I, I think in part the reason we got funded was we said we were gonna build a curriculum at the University of Oklahoma um, to train our students, um, and then we were gonna port that curriculum to the University of Delaware and, and have their faculty implement it there. 
And then we we're going to move that curriculum a second time uh, to the University of Nebraska, and we we're going to have them implement it there. And I think the panel said, no way. <laughs> you can't do that. Um, and, and so I think they're interested in seeing what happens to us. Um, in, in part. <laughs> so um, I'm still here. So we did, we did it at Delaware this year, and, and I'm still alive. So there we go. Um, so uh, I'm going to start with the coursework uh, certificate program. And, and so, the, so uh, our major sort of uh, coursework curriculum is, is offered as a 12-hour as a certificate program. Uh, two courses in the fall, two courses in the spring. It's based on a cohort model. Um, so we would like all the students to come in at one time. Um, and we sort of divide it up into sort of two core uh, types of content, right? So we have the, the content areas which are around social science, sustainability, and earth observation data, right? So open source earth observation data and sort of using those uh, three elements uh, to do innovative science. Um, and then the other piece is around collaboration, which we think of as team science, um, and then specific training about interdisciplinarity, like the lessons learned that come out of previous ICERTs, right, and making sure our students are aware of that, and making sure that they sort of uh, understand that when, you know, they get sort of, they feel tension between, let's say, their disciplinary department and the interdisciplinary program, that like, okay, that, that's this lesson that, um, comes up repeatedly, there isn't an easy solution for that, but at least it gives you some context of, of sort of what you're going through. Um, and then uh, the science communication piece, right, which we um, integrate into uh, both in written and oral communication into uh, our certificate program. Um, the, oh, that didn't come out very well. Um, the, I, the idea for the Earth observation data as the sort of organizing piece for the, for the data science um, came out of an Office of uh, Science and Technology Policy report just suggesting that it, it's a national need to take data that are being produced by investments in infrastructure that we've already made um, that are underused, right? So, so there's all this um, open source data that we're collecting. It can be used for many purposes. It's often only used by the discipline that created the infrastructure for it, right? But it's useful for many disciplines, but most of those disciplines don't know that the instrument is out there or understand how the, how the data can be useful it, it, for their applications, right? And so this is a, it's both a data piece and it's an interdisciplinary understanding piece, right, around the, the data science. And that's sort of going to be a theme um, that I think is something we learned that maybe we didn't expect going in. Um, so here's just sort of a map of, of what it looks like, right? So this is our traditional um, path that we would have in, and I'll say for, biolog for a biologist, right? Not the traditional path for everybody. Um, and then these blue pieces are what we added. Um, here's the certificate. We do a software carpentry boot camp um, up front. We do a lot of evaluation. Um, and I'm mostly going to talk about uh, this piece here and then a little bit about the, the research piece that, that the students will be engaged in uh, later. I, I will say, so at this point, I, we just finished with our second group of students going through the certificate program. And we did things a little bit differently from a lot of uh, programs in that the students don't get the fellowship support till they complete the certificate. So, and this was again pushing on the sustainability issue. Right, so we knew that we could recruit students if we gave them fellowships to go into the certificate, right? Um, but that would mean that the, fellow, that the certificate prog program would also probably collapse as soon as we didn't have fellowships to offer. So at least by pushing it back a year and, and messaging to the students that, hey, this really has to be worth your time to be in this. It, it doesn't make sense to do this just for the fellowship. We're hoping that we get a more sort of uh, a cohort of students that are more interested in the content of the courses, right, rather than just uh, the fellowships. Um, so the data science piece I want to talk a little bit about. So we really uh, push on the open science uh, tools. Um, and, and these are things that, that we really, I would say, expected to uh, train on and I think we're doing a really good job of, right? And so you can see data management, data processing, visualization, open science. Um, and um, it is sort of an expanded 
software boot camp where we go from, and, and in this case, sort of GitHub, uh, Python, um, uh, QGIS are sort of the cores uh, of this, uh, this type of training. Um, and, and I think that that's going relatively well. The other big piece um, that we think about in, in our, uh, from a sort of conceptual uh, level in our certificate program is this methods or interdisciplinary science piece. Um, and I, and I've, I was struck by the students who were here and they spoke uh, very uh, eloquently about the problems of communication, right? And one of the things that we are learning um, as we go is that the communication, I think the communication piece, this methods piece, is a much bigger interdisciplinary problem than the data piece, right? Um, I thought the data piece was going to be a big problem, but it turns out that all of the disciplines, at least that we engage with, um, think of a, they have a data problem. And they think that their students need to be more quantitative. And they think that their students need uh, to learn to program. And so we don't have to push on that at all. If we offer a course that teaches them to do those things, they'll, they'll take them. Um, but where they sort of, uh, where the action is, is, okay, once you can program in Python and once you can access the, the big open source data, what are you trying to do with it? How do you answer the question? What are the filters that your discipline puts between the data and the analysis and the interpretation? And th those conversations are, are fascinating. So this is how we conceptualize what we're trying to do. Um, we have our data, data analysis piece over here, right? And then we have our sort of interdisciplinary uh, communication, science uh, uh, leadership, and teamwork, team science piece over here. And we're in this bubble that we create where we're creating our sort of T-shaped uh, or comb-shaped uh, researchers, right? And those things are all influenced by the institutional setting, so that bureaucracy, Publication outlets is one thing we're finding is an interesting um, uh, issue with regard to interdisciplinary because not all publication outlets would have value in different disciplines, right? So social scientists don't want to work on a project if I'm going to publish a paper in a biological discipline that their discipline doesn't value at all. Um, and research funding. Sometimes what we mean by interdisciplinary is not what funding agencies who are funding things that they say are interdisciplinary are actually looking for. Um, and so you have these passive and active barriers um, that influence this, the bubble that we can create for interdisciplinary research, right? And, and, and it is the sort of community um, of T or comb-shaped individuals in here that do this knowledge generation, right? And so this is sort of a way that we conceptualize the, the process that we're uh, going through. Um, we do have evaluation data. Um, so these are just for the first year, and oh, I'm not going to claim we're successful, but I am going to say I was very happy to see the lines going in the right direction. Okay. <laughs> that's, all, that's all I'm going to say. The lines go up, okay? So we're not, um, we're not making the students worse. That's all I can, that's all. <laughs> we're not making the students worse than when they started, okay? And that is something. Um, and so we'll have, we'll have a second year of evaluation data here uh, relatively soon, right? Um, Um, so I would, just to summarize this sort of section about the curriculum piece, um, we have set, I, I do think, so I'm in the middle of it. It's really hard for me to process like what exactly is going on. Um, um, I would reiterate something that Fred said, terrific student fellows and, um, and they are the thing that keeps us going. Um, we have had really good institutional support, particularly administrative support and sort of giving us the space to kind of create. Um, and, we, and our training team has been remarkably cohesive, right? They've stuck with it and they've stuck together and the faculty show up um, when really, you know, in, in a busy schedule, maybe there isn't a lot of incentive that I can offer to get them to show up. Um, at the same time, um, I'm finding that our bureaucracy lacks agility, right, to make changes sort of midstream. Uh, it takes a long time to change a ship of this size. Um, and, and that goes back to the sort of making pieces of the T fit, right? So we, we have a better idea now, two years in, sort of how to do this than we did two years ago. But we need to rearrange some things. Um, and, and that's getting hard. And the maintaining partnerships one is, um, 
So we have personal, personal relationships with people that we can train with, let's say, in private industry or government, right? I'm becoming more and more aware how frequently people change jobs um, and go to different places and move. Um, and so if at some level you can't build a um, organization to organization partnership that's more robust, it can be very difficult to sort of keep uh, an ongoing uh, partnership over this span of time. Okay, so uh, things that we propose to do are now um, going to be very difficult just because there's all brand new people in the positions that we thought we were um, making partnerships with. Um, I do want to just talk briefly about um, uh, broadening participation. So this was a, a, a big concern of our uh, training team. Um, and so uh, we wrote a supplement grant uh, to the NRT program to say, could we host a symposium on this? Says was there. Uh, so we had, I think, five NRT teams there. And, and I show you this, uh, this diversity scorecard because this is sort of a framework that we used um, for, for institutional analysis. Right? So we, went, we asked our institutions to basically spend a year of introspection and saying, OK, how do you deal with issues around access retention, institutional receptivity, and excellence. You know, so what is your definition of excellence in graduate education? How do you measure it? Um, and, and how do you achieve it? And how does that affect the people who participate in your, uh, in your program? And, and so each institution sort of came out with a different answer um, because of the way their institution was and how their program fit within the institution. I mean, I can talk more about this um, because for those of you who participated, you know it was, um, there was a lot of stuff there. Um, and so then we compared that with, um, this is on the, uh, whatever side that is, the left-hand side, is, uh, is some targets of success um, or, or predictors of, of PhD completion that come out of the councils of graduate schools, right? Um, and so what we were comparing is sort of our answers on our scorecard to the predictors of, of PhD completion and saying, are we actually supporting the students through these steps at our institution? Right? And, and if not, if we find those gaps, and the idea there was to find the gaps, then how do we uh, fill those gaps so that we can be more effective sort of programmatically at, at, at uh, increasing participation? Um, and just sort of one example at OU, uh, Sarah Mata is our program coordinator. Um, and so um, we looked at the issue of access and how we were um, getting information about our graduate programs to students. Um, and and how those students were finding us in terms of applying, right? And this was part of the, I think Laura mentioned uh, the data, like you know how, how much data is available to those students if they want to make an informed choice. Um, and so uh, this fall, on November 2nd, we'll have our first uh, Preparing to Go to Graduate School conference for undergraduates at OU um, that actually explains to them sort of how graduate school works, what programs we have, um, how do they apply, you know, how should they search for good programs in their area? And this is something we hadn't been doing. I mean, other institutions do things like this, but when we did our analysis for us, this is something like we have to get better at this because our students are not coming to our graduate school, and that seems silly. Um, okay, so um, just the last piece is the aeroecology piece, right? And so I'm an ornithologist. I study birds. I love birds. Um, I like to catch them and follow them around. Um, but, um, but, but in some ways, that is a really limiting sort of study design if you're interested in sort of global problems, right? It's hard to follow enough individual birds around to understand how uh, global environmental change is impacting them. Um, and as I went from sort of banding birds and putting, and, and so at, through my career, I sort of scaled up, right? I started putting bands on birds, and then I started doing some chemical tracer, stable isotope work uh, with birds, and then I started uh, working with colleagues to sort of build tracking devices in the era of biologging. But still, it's hard to scale that up. And so like, how do you get to the sort of big data monitoring the globe um, kind of uh, migration patterns? And so that was my challenge, and that's what led me to aeroecology. Um, because it turns out that the University of Oklahoma is a world leader in weather radar technology uh, and weather radar data processing. And, um, and so this provides us indirect observations, right? So this is a, um, a map of the, um, the weather on the night of September 29th, 2011. And so this is what, sort of what we're, we're used to looking at, is, is a map of the radar data for weather. 
what you don't, usually don't hear is that the radars are actually collecting a lot more data than what you see. So this is filtered down to the weather. Um, the, the, what the r weather radars were collecting is this. That's all birds. <laughs> That's bird migration on, the, uh, on September 29th, 2011. So most bird migration is nocturnal. Um, and there's a couple of things that are cool about this, right? I can go back to 2011 and say, when was migration in 2011, right? Which I can't do with any of my tracked birds, right? Um, I can do it at big spatial scales um, and, and back into the mid-90s, essentially, because of the, the archive. So this opens up possibilities for, for our science, right? Um, all the data are on Amazon Web Services now, so you can just go get them. Um, no special requirements. Um, and so we start asking bigger scale questions, right? And so this is what we're pushing our students toward is, so you're interested, you, many of them come to us with a specific focus, ecological focus or around sustainability. And so this would be my example of how you go to a, a, a bigger platform for things in the air and start to ask more global questions. Or I can now uh, compare my tracking data and say, how has phenology changed and those sorts of things. But, but so we're, we're looking for those, our students to sort of use this same approach to take their deep disciplinary knowledge and say, how do I, how do I go out and use the sort of bigger data um, sets that are out there? This is where you require collaborations, right? Um, this is my collaborator, Phil Chilson, who I've worked with for a long time. Um, he's a physicist, uh, cloud physics, um, and uh, he knows a lot more math than I do. Um, and so this makes using weather radar data possible for me. Um, because if I have questions about things, I can go talk to him and, and he can do some of the heavy lifting on the processing, right? And so, um, and so this is one of the benefits of interdisciplinary collaboration, right? And so this lets us build um, sort of regional phenologies based on new data that had never been used to create phenologies before, right? And we can compare those phenologies sort of up and down the East Coast in a way that if I was tracking my individual birds, I'd you know, it would be impossible. Okay, so this is a nice data, this is a nice um, sort of basic science story about phenology. And so the, I come back to, so, so how, does, how can this be used sort of to push us toward this convergence, right? How does this, how can I use this to answer an important societal question, right? Um, and so we think about a convergence in aeroecology, so all of these things in the air um, around the crowding of the sky, right? So these are all ways that we use the sky, right? Um, it, if, you, if you look at Time Magazine, I think this week, uh, there's a, there's a, the cover is, is um, completely made up of drones flying. So they, they made the cover of Time Magazine with drones in the air, right? And thinking about the possibility of, of you know, all kinds of deliveries with UAS, plus transportation, communication, all that other stuff. Um, and so the potential for conflicts grows, right, as our use of the atmosphere grows. And we start to think of this as a, a resource that needs to be managed, right? And so how do we understand it? And, and then how do we come up with sensible policies around managing it? Um, and that requires our basic science, but it requires other partners as well, right? And so this is just out of a paper um, in bioscience where we talk about uh, you know, flight safety, collision risks, um, the potential for sort of nuisance pest control, um, and all of the partners, crop damage, all of the partners we would need to start to manage um, those types of interactions um, of all of the organisms that are using the airspace primarily to get to where they're going and, and do what they do. Um, and so that's something that we're um, interested in, in expanding on. Um, if I see the sort of growth of our program, it's in this sort of applied aeroecology um, and how do we build partnerships um, into the, the uh, other sectors of the economy, I'll say. Okay, so my takeaways. Um, I think interdisciplinary graduate education is critical, uh, right? But it's critical also for this culture of convergence. If you want people at your institution who are willing to reach out beyond the walls of the academic institution and work with those partners and respect the values that come with those communities, you have to do this type of training, right? At the same time, our institutions um, are maybe not built completely for that. And I think centers, 
uh, consortia, federations, are a way to sort of to be within the institution, but to have a separate set of rules that are more flexible and allow these sorts of things. I'm hoping at the University of Oklahoma, the Plains Institute, which is brand new, uh, which is me right now, um, <laughs> uh, we'll have that sort of culture and we'll be able to implement uh, that, that sort of um, process. Um, I guess I'm, uh, I'll, I'll wait for questions. I just wanted to point out that uh, we are running, if, if you want to learn to use radar to answer <laughs> biological questions, um, let me know. We're going to run our second training school uh, this summer. Thanks. <laughs>